The events of that one-of-a-kind year, 1968, cast a shadow to this day, not least the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy 50 years ago this week. Our cover story is reported by Jim Axelrod. But now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Thank you. When Robert F. Kennedy stepped from the stage at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, his walk through the kitchen moments later would become the violent bookend to one of the most turbulent stretches in American history. I am announcing today my candidacy. Just three months earlier, Kennedy had announced he would take on the sitting president from his own party. I do not lightly dismiss the dangers and the difficulties of challenging an incumbent president. But these are not ordinary times. A short while later, with anti-Vietnam War sentiment spiking, Lyndon Johnson pulled out of the race. I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Do they know about Martin Luther King? And just four days after that... Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. And that was... Finally, a few minutes after midnight on June 5th, 1968, America faced the murder of yet another Kennedy. Five shots. Journalist Pete Hamill, who helped subdue Robert Kennedy's assassin, says the wound America suffered that night has yet to heal. It's a story of what might have been, not about what happened, but what we lost when it happened. What did we lose? Hope. I want the Democratic Party and the United States of America to stand for hope instead of despair. My father gave people hope. He lifted them up. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend is the oldest of Robert and Ethel Kennedy's 11 children. She says people found that hope in the questions her father was asking. We have this great wealth, $800 billion a year. We have all of this military power. And yet, how do we use it? What do we do with it? How do we make moral choices? How do we help our fellow human being? That is the most meaningful thing you can do. And it was their faith in the answers he offered that helped him build a coalition that's implausible, if not impossible, to imagine today. He could speak to white working class men and women because they trusted him that he would fight for them. And he also fought for African Americans. If you talk to those who met him, you never sense that he felt he was better than you. He was with you. The story of Bobby Kennedy, as his loyalists tell it, is a tale of transformation. From hard-charging law and order young attorney, hunting communists on Joe McCarthy's staff in the early 1950s, to social justice warrior by the late 60s. He was not just a speaker. He would listen to what people were saying after the great wound of his brother's assassinated. And he understood, I think, that part of him, although he came from the Irish, part of him was Jewish, part of him is Latino. If I had a head to hair like that, I could get elected anyway. <laughs> For somebody as famous as he was, he was living his life, not performing it. A young senator from New York who used his bold-faced name, fame, and political capital to focus on the forgotten. Senator Robert Kennedy, the rich man's son, has come to Mississippi, the poorest state in the Union, to see the rural side of poverty. How did the trip to the Delta come about? By a miracle. <laughs> Marion Wright Edelman, a young lawyer working with the poor in Mississippi, was right there with Kennedy in April of 1967 and knew his power with the people he was meeting. In most shacks, you would see Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy's pictures. But Edelman says she was not prepared to like him because, as attorney general, Kennedy had authorized the wiretapping of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. Still, there Kennedy was. Well, I'd love to do that with you. In Mississippi, putting poverty on the map. Do you enjoy this course? Is it helping you? Yes, sir. I'm learning how to read and write pretty good. He was just shocked. 
Good luck to you. Peter Edelman, who would meet Marion on the trip and later marry her, was a Kennedy aide. You see children with swelling bellies, with running sores. He said to me, I've been in third and fourth world countries and I haven't seen anything as terrible as this. For a citizen living here in the state of Mississippi, you're doing reasonably well. You don't run up against this kind of poverty. I watched him interact with children, and the thing that I grew to like most about him and to see that he was really absorbing it was his touch. He would rub a child's cheek, and that meant a lot to me. A lot of people in this room, aren't they? A little more than a year after that trip, Bobby Kennedy was gone. I, I didn't expect that to happen. Writer Pete Hamill is still haunted. Dear Bob, I had wanted to write you a long letter. So taken by RFK's potential, he had written him, begging him to get into the race. The fight you might make would be the fight of honor. I have to take my share of responsibility. He thought Bobby Kennedy uniquely positioned to address the divisions in America. When we dealt with Vietnam. If you won, the country might be saved. I think I've learned a lesson, and I think that from that lesson, that I think that we can do better in the future. Kennedy would campaign with that letter in his jacket pocket. It actually makes me remember those times. I read it now, and I regret the part I had in making, if I did, in making him make the choice because of a young dope with a pistol. You do think about that part of it. I do. Did he ever express his own fear that he, too, might be assassinated? Never. Never. You think it was in there? He just didn't talk about it? I think it was in there. Because when I saw him that night, there was a kind of look on his face that was, I knew this was going to happen. Decades later, how Bobby Kennedy died is still raising questions. Last week, two of his children called for a new investigation into whether there was a second gunman. Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. June 6, 1968. He was 42 years old. But what's being marked this week is the meaning of his life. As he said many times, in many parts of this nation. 50 years ago, Robert Kennedy was eulogized by his brother Ted. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. A train carried his body from New York City to the nation's capital. The funeral train is an old tradition in American life. This is a familiar route. All along the way, there have been people along the tracks. That train ride was supposed to be three hours, and instead, it turned almost seven hours. Two million people came out. African Americans in Baltimore singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Nobody organized this. It was spontaneous. They stand, they wave, some of them are crying. What did he have that touched so many people? His love, his courage, and his ability to relate. There are plenty of people in this country who find the story of the Kennedys an exercise in grand-scale myth-making. But this Sunday morning, there are many others marking and mourning the night half a century ago when what may have been the brightest spark of political hope in their lifetimes was extinguished. It's hard to know exactly what heals. There's pain that lasts for 50 years. It's enormous sadness, an enormous sense of loss. I'm not a believer that time heals all wounds at all. I think the wounds stay for a long time.